So I'm, I'm, thank you, John. When John says jump, I jump, so I'm here. I'm Tina Roth Eisenberg, but most people know me as Swiss Miss, which is the name of my uh, Twitter handle and my blog. And it's not just a smart branding move. Uh, I actually grew up in Switzerland. This is what it kind of looked like outside of my house growing up. When, when John asked me to uh, participate here, I always say yes to John. And then he said, we have to talk about growth. I was like, what? The only thing growth related I could think of was that we had a growth chart at Tatlin, our old studio, that uh, I really, really loved. And actually almost made me want to have investors. So if they would ask about growth, I could show them this. <laughs> and by the way, my, my kids never understood why this was funny. Because I think they didn't understand that grown-ups don't grow anymore in that sense. <laughs> So, but uh, then the other thing that came to mind is that I am from a corner in Switzerland called Appenzell that is known for very short people. <laughs> literally, right? So I literally outgrew the place I'm from, the teeny tiny town of 3,000 people. So in 1999, I moved to New York for what was supposed to be a three-month internship. The universe unleashed itself on me, got me a job within 20 hours of arriving, and just basically all the signs were just like, mar, 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 Tina, you're staying, you're staying. So 18 years later, I am still in New York, but I have started so many things and experienced so much in these 18 years that I grew personally a whole bunch. If there's one recommendation I can give you is that move somewhere where you don't know a single soul. Because man, what a moment of truth when you have to figure out who is your community and who are you. And that possibility of completely redefining who you are because nobody has yet put you in any of the drawers. So I, I think that this was the moment where the community builder in me, which a lot of people call me now, has started because I was really, really, really careful and intentional about who I let into my new, work, my new life in New York. So I literally built my community and as in building, also growing them. So in 2005, I was pregnant with my daughter, Ella, and I don't know what happened with me, but I took inventory of my life and I just started dissecting my whole life and where I was and where I wanna go. And she actually asked me, she texted me this morning, She's like, are you talking about me again? She just wanna check in and make sure I mention her. Cause she knows that every time I speak, I cannot not talk about the impact she had on my life and on my career. And in a complete opposite way that everyone else always talks about. Like she was the rocket fuel to my career. Everything I started, started with her. The day I was born, I started my design studio. I always wanted one, but I have no idea why I waited until I was pregnant and my body went into this like inventory taking uh, overdrive. So the day she was born, I started my design studio. And then when she was two, I started an in a co-working space called Friends Work Here. Uh, I started at the same time Creative Mornings, which I will talk about later. And then so here I'm running a design studio and I'm busy and I get pregnant again. And with my son, Tilo, <laughs> and you know what happens? I took inventory again and I realized I don't like having clients. I don't want clients. And I went on a one-year sabbatical, which was possible because of my blog, Swiss Miss, um, made some income and it gave me that freedom. And in that year, in that magical year of thinking, I started a to-do app called To-Do. Any To-Do users in here? Yes, I will hug you afterwards. Um, and, and then I started Tatly, a temporary tattoo company. So my kids have been complete career boosts for me and have been the turning points of my career. And, um, and, and her, their birth dates have always been sort of the milestone for me to rethink of how, uh, just remind me of how far I've come. But if you put me on a pedestal, which a lot of people do and makes me very uncomfortable, I can just tell you, nope, I am not a superhero. Like just all of you, I have a lot of this going on. Massive imposter syndrome all the time. I didn't go to business school. I have no idea and, and no reason why I should be running businesses. So, but I'm holding on to this feeling. I'm learning every day to allow the space between where I want to be and where I am to inspire and not terrify me. Anyone with me on this one? Yeah. 11 and a half years ago, when I started my design studio, for some reason, I thought at that point in my life that there's a perfect way, that the perfect way to run a company and to lead 
and, and to be a boss. So I started reading all these books about leadership and how to run a company and I started talking to people that I admired that were running companies and so many of the things that my friends told me or that I read completely did not resonate with me. And I thought it's me, right? I thought I'm just not there yet, I'm not understanding it way yet. yet. But what I've learned over the past few years, and I really just sort of came to trust my own ability in running a company, is that there is no right way. In fact, I think what we do as, and, and as entrepreneurs is like, we create the environment. <laughs> like what I had to learn is that I create a company that is based on my energy, that vibrates with my enthusiasm, that is built on my values, and now I have to let people in that completely thrive in that environment. So next time you don't get a job, you know what, maybe it was a blessing, because maybe you would have not thrived in that environment. It would not have been the right fit for you. So this is about last year when I sort of had that realization that it's okay, Tina, you're doing it differently. I just show up with my heart. I am a complete mush boss. I'm like a mom. I, I care so much for the people I work with. I lead from the heart with a real love for people. And a lot of my, I have some friends who are more from the traditional um, uh, entrepreneurial spirit and they criticize me all the time. It's like, Tina, you need to be tougher on your people. And at this point, it's just like Teflon. It rolls off of me because I, I see how my, my team is thriving and how happy they are. How happy they are. Um, and I run my companies with, um, like with a lot of empowerment and trust. Uh, a lot of my t people that start working for me after a few weeks, they go like, wait, wait, you really trust me and you let me run with this? Like you let me be the CEO of shipping and I can make things better on my own? I'm like, yeah, that's why I hired you. I want to get out of your way. Um, so on, in order to get the people in that help me grow my companies, I sort of have become slightly obsessed with interview questions. Because I mean, let's, let's be real, interviews are so awkward. And, uh, but I feel like it all comes down to asking the right question that's a really surface to people um, uh, that will help me make my community and my family better. Like I really look at my work as a family. So what I'm gonna do over the next few minutes is share five of my favorite interview questions and then explain to you why I ask them because they relate to something I really care about. Um, these are questions I might also ask you over dinner, with the exception of the first one. Because the first one, I wouldn't ask you, why do you want this job if we had dinner? Um, but you wouldn't believe how many people cannot answer this question. For goodness sakes, if you apply for a job somewhere, hey, really know what they stand for, what, they, what they're about. Um, and I just really want someone that shows up with such a fire in their soul and they know why I'm running my companies and, and that that fire just like, I need to see it in them. And I saw this really beautiful Twitter rant last week by this guy, I don't know him. Does anyone know who Boone Cotter is from Australia? No? Has anyone seen this thread as well? No? Anyway, I, I loved every minute of it. So this guy traveled from Australia to interview at Naughty Dog. And he kind of said, like, I, I knew already I'm not going to get this job, but he loves that gaming company so much that he was willing to travel around the globe. So he's sitting there, super nervous, and then apparently some, he mentioned some name, like some high-powered guy comes in that he really, really respects, and he gets even more nervous. And then they ask him the question, why do you want to work here? And he does the usual, well, you're the, good, the best in the industry, blah, 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 you know, that boring stuff. And then apparently he went full stop. And he started getting all emotional. He says, no, actually, the reason why I want to work with you is the character Bill. Again, I'm not a gamer. I have no idea who this guy is. But it's the character Bill from The Last of Us. He says, for the first time ever, I've seen a gay man portrayed as masculine, tragically heroic, a burly, hairy, daddy bear character like myself. And he started crying. Guess what? He got the job. Uh, <laughs> So I tell you, when somebody shows up with that much love and passion for something I've done, I will hire that person. So just my tip to you is know what you want and why you want it. And be sure to be able to articulate it. And a lot of people that, I guess, again, again the old fashioned people, they don't believe that feelings have anything to do, like feelings are not allowed at work, man. When you work with me, feelings are A-OK. -okay. Because if I want you to have a fire in your soul when you work with me, the, automatically you will have a lot of feelings. 
So how do you hire for the people that are so passionate? I have three tips for you. For any one of you that is hiring, and one of them was for my accountant. So when we have a job description out, I ask for three things. A, a thoughtful, thoughtful cover letter. Why do you want to, I ask that question, why do you want to work for our company? And then three, this is the kicker. I ask for a joke. First of all, if they don't respond, all of them, they're not, they're not detail oriented and they're out. It's a really, it's like a selection process right there. But the third, the funny joke, that was a tip from my accountant. It's the best selection method ever. Because you know what? It shows if somebody has Fingerspitzengefühl, which is a word that America <laughs> needs to adopt. Um, it, it's a German word that I miss so much, and it basically it describes a great situation, situational awareness and the ability to respond most appropriately and tactfully. So you wouldn't believe how many inappropriate jokes I'm getting. I was like, dude, man, I'm not even, I'm not even big on jokes, but I would spend a good 20 minutes Googling a good one that fits the company and the values. No. But sometimes I get, I get just these nuggets where I was like, I actually want to hire this person just based on the joke. And one of the people that has applied last year was uh, Paul Leung, who's now our uh, director of content at Creative Mornings. If you get our Creative Mornings newsletters, he's the force behind it. He, he knew me so well that he knew I love gifts. And he, instead of a joke, he sent a GIF. And I remember laughing out loud. I was like, ah, he's so hired. Um, <laughs> but the day after we offered him the job, I got the, the most impressive job application I've ever gotten. I was so impressed that I had sleepless nights because we just gave that job to someone else. So this woman, Emerlyn, she applied and she made a website. It had multiple, like it had, it had multiple sections and, um, and she used our typefaces. She had a special button. She totally got us. And then there was this, this is the kicker. She had eight fun, fun facts, a section that was called fun facts. I remember like thinking of her three nights in a row in the middle of the night. I was like, all right, all right, my subconscious is telling me something. So I asked her to have lunch with me. And it turns out that she had, um, she's been to 17 creative mornings. She was like a super fan. And she said this one thing in this lunch that completely like made my heart explode. She said, you know, I dragged my cousins, my mom, and f people that wanted to be friends with me to Creative Mornings, because I told them, if you want to understand me and how I operate in the world and how I show up in the world, then you got to come to this with me. And if this resonates with me, we're probably going to be friends. Guess what? We made a job for her. Um, <laughs> and, and then this is another application that really blew my mind. Uh, one, one day I came back from a conference, and everybody stared at me as I walked in, because there was a white box on my desk. And it was kind of weird, like, all right, hi, everybody. So I go to my desk, and I open this box, and there was a Viewmaster in there, and the application for a job that actually didn't exist was on the Viewmaster, and we made a job for it. So I'm just saying, <laughs> so thoughtful, so creative, so, like, they really did their homework. Like, this is, this is the type of people I want to work for, work with. Um, all right, second question. This one is usually a question I ask towards, it's really good for dinner parties, by the way. But in interview questions, I usually keep that one for the very end. Because by then, I hope they're, they feel comfortable and we had some good conversations and, and they're relaxed. Because th with this one, what I'm going after is how much do they trust me? How much do they trust me to possibly overshare? I am like the oversharer par excellence. So, um, because trust is really the thing I've learned a lot about with Creative Mornings. So Creative Mornings started out with, because of the reason that I lived in New York, I didn't know anyone, I couldn't afford the AIGA events. <laughs> I made such little money, sorry. Um, <laughs> and I was really craving for an event, a, a, an easy way to get together with my like-minded community. So once I had a co-working space, I was like, wait a second, I'm crazy not to open up my doors. So I started just experimenting and doing a prototype and starting, I announced it on my blog, Friday mornings, a lecture, a talk, some free coffee. And everyone laughed at me and said, it's never going to work because A, people don't get up early in New York. And how are you going to keep that free? And I was like, yeah, whatever, we'll see. I remember this one. This was a may maybe an, a year and a half in when Koi Vin, at the time design director at the New York Times, uh, spoke in this beautiful place called Meetup at the Apartment. And we, were, we crammed 80 people in there. And I thought I'm at the top of my game, not realizing that eventually this would grow. 
And I really think Clay Shirky explains, explains why this was so uh, successful, because we systematically overestimate the value of access to information and underestimate the value of access to each other more than ever. So I ran it for two years in New York. Um, uh, companies invited me in. And then some, uh, this guy, Daniel in Zurich, asked me if, if he could host in Zurich. And I was like, meh. But then my friend John asked me right like a week later, because he was moving to LA. He's like, please, please let me take it to LA. And I just want to give credit to those two guys, and especially John. Um, and if you haven't seen the Derek Sivers, how, to, how a movement starts, please look it up. Because it takes gut, guts to be a first follower. Being a first follower is an underappreciated, underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms alone, not into a leader. If you ever had a hesitation around following someone, somebody that's, something, that's doing something interesting, just give yourself credit and do it. Anyway, now we're in 177 cities in over 63 countries. We grow by about three chapters a month. And all because we have like uh, global partners that help us grow and help me sustain a, um, the HQ. I want to just show you a few pictures for those of you that don't know uh, about Creative Mornings. They happen once a month on a Friday morning. We have a global theme. They hap we have a, uh, at this point, there's like 20,000 people getting together every month for free. Um, for any one of you who's ever seen the Oprah Winfrey uh, Pharrell moment where he starts crying, I usually get very teary-eyed when I see these photos. This was in a circus tent in Austin. Um, and this, this organization is entirely um, possible because we have 177 hosts that jump through a lot of hoops to become the host in their city, and then they build their own volunteer network. It is an engine of generosity with 1,500 volunteers in total. And what I've learned um, is that once you start trusting people, because we built, we built basically the non-negotiables, we made sure we picked the right people that they're low in ego and high in, in, in heart. And, but what I learned is by letting go, a complete match it can happen, and this is now a global, la a, a, a global labor of love. And trust is the biggest compliment of all. When you trust someone, chances are high if, you ha if it's the right person, the right personality, they will not disappoint. So who do you admire? This question is so telling. When people have a hard time answering this, I'm like, man, really? I, there's so many people I could recite right now that I look up to for various reasons. But I think people that think about this question are people that want to grow and are constantly trying to learn and become better. So just to give you a quick for example, three examples. I have a really long list. Ben Chestnut, the way he operates in the world, how he shows up with his company MailChimp, and how he is the patron of the creative world, um, how generous he operates in the world, and weird, embraces the weird. He is such a role model to me. My good friend Maggie Doyne, if you don't know her, look her up. I have never seen a, a human with a bigger heart. She has adopted 52 or, uh, orphans in Nepal. She's building a school. She runs a nonprofit called Lip Blink Now. The generosity and love she exudes is unstoppable. Then recently I met Vicky Saunders, who started CEO. She's literally changing the landscape of female entrepreneurship and is changing the model of VC. Look her up. All of these people aim to improve, grow, make a difference, and they all operate from a place of generosity. And I really believe that where we are in this world right now, there is no time to, this is not the time to think small. And I really believe if you think of the universe to be a place of abundance, then it will be. And I love this question that, that Vicky Saunders asks all the time. What if we were all surrounded by radical generosity? The term radical generosity really gets me in the heart. Imagine if you were surrounded by radically generous people day in and day out. Imagine what you could do. I remember when I started Creative Mornings, everyone told me it's not gonna work, you're not gonna keep it free. It was our ninth birth birthday on Tuesday and 20,000 people get together every month because of it. And generosity is the business strategy of Creative Mornings. Same for Tatley, my temporary tattoo company. I started it, A, because my daughter had shitty temporary tattoos and I wanted to fix it. <laughs> and, and B, I have so many illustrator friends who say the licensing world is really broken. And I pay a way higher royalty than, like every time we invite an artist to come in and I, sh I send them the contract, they go like, what? 
uh, are you sure about that royalty? And I was like, yeah, it's important to me of every single sale. A cut goes back to the artist. And um, the middle of this year, we reached a million that we paid out in artist royalties. And it makes me proud and it makes me happy. Um, at the same time, we try to be really supportive with, we do a ton of custom with really cool brands. And sometimes a, 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 you know, a brand comes to us and they can maybe not afford it, an organization. And we do that for free. For example, we did the Women's March tattoos and, and there's a lot of uh, companies we try to uh, support. Um, doing good and being generous is a, is a way of life and it's a beautiful way of life. And I try to instill that with my team. I have such remarkable people that work with me. Poor of them, I squished them all on these stairs for a photo. I was like, what is she doing again? Anyway, this is my team that I work with. And I, I tell them every day, like we, we're not just making a difference with, with how we run our companies and what our companies present in the world. I want you to make a difference every single day in the way you do your job. For example, I really believe in the five-minute favor that Adam Grant once coined in Give and Take. It is so easy sometimes just to spend five minutes and you can open a door for someone. Could, it could be an introduction or, for example, sometimes when, when I get invited to speak to uh, conferences and I can't go, I reply, I say thank you, I say, hey, I, I can't do it, but have you ever thought of these people? And I oftentimes include people that just should be given a chance to speak that maybe this conference organizer has never thought of. It's so simple, it takes five minutes. Or for example, I have this new rule that I live by. If I think a compliment, I force myself to say it. I feel like so many times we think like, wow, she did that well, or that shirt is nice, or whatever it is. Sometimes even meetings, when somebody did an amazing job in how they handled a difficult conversation, just tell them, like we don't compliment each other enough. And by the way, this is the entrance to our office. It has like a mirrored film and it says, you look great today. The minute we put this up, we became selfie less central. We actually filmed the people from upstairs. It was pretty funny. <laughs> but then my all time favorite is a phrase you hear all the time when you work at Creative Mornings. It's called, I usually say, go dolphin on them. So a few years ago, I read this article in the New York Times, you can Google it what Shamu taught me about a happy marriage. It's this journalist that followed a dolphin trainer uh, um, for a few days. And she learns that when you train dolphins, um, you only reward the, the good behavior. And you completely ignore the, the bad stuff. And she went like, hmm. She went home and did the same thing with her husband. And, uh, <laughs> and their marriage apparently took complete like, woo! It was amazing. So I told my team, you know, we run a volunteer organization of 1,500 people, people volunteering their time. We can't go and police them. Like, they're volunteering their time. But what we can do is really get their competitive edge out when we start highlighting the chapters that are doing an amazing job. So what we do on a regular basis is saying, hey, did you guys see Austin's team? Look at how they did the breakfast. Or did you see how they did the signage? Or did you see X? And everybody's a little competitive, right? So, and it gets the best out of everyone. So go dolphin on someone. All right, what do you do when you're not working? That's a good question. And a really key one, if, if you have no answer here, I don't think I'm going to offer you a job. I love people who have side projects. I love coming to work. And you know why? Because I have really interesting people that work for me. They all have some weird obsessions that, that, that keep them up at night. For example, Hans, who has been with us for a long time. He's like this secret closet perfume maker. It's amazing. Uh, Sally, who is our uh, head of community at Creative Mornings, she's a super engaged uh, social activist. Kyle is our COO at Creative Mornings. He loves dogs. And he is like community builder extraordinaire. He has this thing called Right Shop where he gets people together on Wednesday mornings and just like you sit down for an hour and a half and you just commit to writing in, in like within you know, his community and sometimes you talk about what you're writing about. He also has a bocce club and so on. Um, Christine, our design director at Tatwee, she is the most badass, badass um, cosplay costume <laughs> creator. A world I knew nothing about before I met Christina. And then this is Paul, the, you know, the GIF, have you just become best friends? Um, he's our uh, content director at Creative Mornings. And he, he's like this person that just, when he says, I'm commi committing to learning something, he goes all out. He just, a few months ago, started picking up photography. And look at it, he's amazing. I keep telling him in every meeting when he tells us about you know, what he's photographing now and how he's learning. I was like, please don't become a photographer because he's such a good content manager. I'm afraid he's gonna switch jobs. <laughs> so anyway, our lunches are really interesting and we take lunch seriously. 
We have a absolutely zero desk. Like you cannot eat at your desk. Like I even say that in job interviews. If you're the type of person that is an introvert and wants to eat at your desk, like just don't come work here. We have salad clubs. We do this thing called cherry and pits before every meeting where I, we, and this is obviously only works in small meetings, but it's so beautiful. Um, we, we basically share, like in this weekly meeting, we share something that's positive and something that's bumming us out. Um, take, doesn't take long, but it, it just, it's really beautiful just for setting the tone of a meeting. Uh, sometimes we send each other a photo if we miss each other when they're on vacation. We have um, a, a Slack channel where we, where we put off quotes when we say funny stuff, when we keep them. And also we, we share funny photos of each other from the studio. We sometimes do Lego challenges. We have a Friday wind down where we uh, sit on the fire escape and drink wine and welcome the weekend and wave to everybody that's walking by. Um, my favorite thing is our happy hour. So we're Tatley Creative Mornings, uh, my co-working space friends, we're all in the same ecosystem and also attached to a, like all in one big building with artists and residents. It's just like this building bring them of creativity. And once a month we get everyone together and we invite people in from the outside and we do very easy five minute talks uh, and oftentimes it's people that talk about their latest obsessions or something new project they've done and then there's wine and drinks. It's so easy and you can replicate that. It's the best thing we've ever done for a community. Uh, Puppyparty.com, you can rent four puppies for an hour. So great. Um, we take birthdays seriously and not just per like our company birthdays. Every year we make a piñata for Tatley. Um, we, we party. Uh, and then once a year, I take my teams to an offsite. We take a private chef, three days in driving distance from New York. We look at the year, um, we look at back of the year, what, what, what worked, what didn't work. Everybody has to make a mini presentation on their department and reflect, and then we plan out the new year. And then this is something my team started whenever somebody new starts with us. There's confetti hearts on the table and confetti ta and tatly hearts and, and notes, and I just really love, most of these things, by the way, I didn't start. It's my my community self-organizers, they have, they started all of these things. So I make friends, not colleagues. I know a lot of books say you don't make friends at work, I do. All right, and this is the last one from courtesy of my son. This is his favorite would you rather question. Raise your hand if you would rather fart confetti. Yeah. Good, I'll tell him. Um, so when I ask this question, sometimes people get really uncomfortable. I was like, oh man, you gotta get comfortable with stuff like this if you wanna work with me. Um, I wanna make a difference in the world with the products and services I create. And I wanna work hard, but I wanna have fun. So sometimes there's uh, confetti cannons that go off. Uh, we also try to instill a lot of character into our products. When you like a video on Creative Mornings, uh, did you see that? It rains hearts. I really love that. There we go. Um, on our cities page on Creative Mornings, you can sort them by rainbow, because we have all these colors. No functionality, but makes me happy. Um, <laughs> You would not believe this though, this feature actually pissed people off. You can sort by single. Isn't that the greatest if you're single in your new city? <laughs> Whenever we get the hate emails on those, I'm just like, oh my God, Teflon all the way. I'm just letting roll off my back. Um, and then for example, if you have an Aero, Aero 404 page of Tatley, uh, that's actually a Tatley you can only buy there on the Aero page. It's actually a product page. Uh, we have a swing in our office. And we have a prop box, because sometimes you need a Viking helmet to respond to certain emails. <laughs> but my all-time favorite is our confetti drawer. Like, we take confetti seriously, and every business needs a confetti drawer. So we try to sprinkle the possibility of a smile into uh, everything we do. And I am just secretly hoping, now all of this said, I'm secretly hoping for a new defi definition of success that goes beyond money and power. My personal uh, definition of success is when I see happiness and growth around me. And we just all need to start giving a damn, man. Uh, we all need to start showing up with our hearts. Um, and it doesn't matter if you run a small team or just a family or whatever it is, or a big company, I really believe we can all make a difference. If you show up and you're, you treat your people with respect and you make them feel hurt and you make them feel safe, 
and you allow them to be vulnerable and be human, they go home and they're, they're better spouses and moms and dads and, and, and they're just, we have a better society. I really believe there's a lack of empathy and kindness at work these days. And if you don't know where to start, if I, I, just, I just ask you to take away one thing. Just try to think about where you can add a sense of play and generosity and kindness into your world. And if you don't know where to start, uh, fill a drawer with confetti. Uh, start saying compliments when you think them. Or start doing five-minute favors. Mm -hmm.